Euthydemus by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Scene, the Lyceum. Who was that person, Socrates, uh, with whom you were talking yesterday uh, at the Lyceum? There was such a crowd around you that I could not get within hearing, but I caught a sight of him over their heads, and I made out, as I thought, that he was a stranger with whom you were talking. Uh, who was he? Ah, there were two, Crito. Which one of them do you mean? Oh, the, the one whom I mean... Uh, was seated second from you on your right-hand side. In the middle was Tlinius, uh, the young son of Axiochus, who has wonderfully grown. He's only about he's only about the age of my own Critobulus, but he's uh, much better looking. Uh, the other one is thin and looks younger than he is. Ah, uh, the one whom you mean, Crito is Euthydemus, and on my left-hand side there was his brother, Dionysodorus, who also took part in the conversation. Neither of them are known to me, Socrates. They are a new importation of sophists, as I should imagine. Of what country are they from, and uh, what what is their line of wisdom? Well, as to their origin, Crito, I believe that they are natives of this part of the world, and have migrated from Chios to Thurii. Then <laughs> they were driven out of Thurii, and have been living for many years in these regions. As to their line of wisdom about which you ask, Crito, uh, they are simply excellent. I never knew before what the true Pancratiast was. Uh, they are simply, in simple terms, working on competition. Not like the two Acarnanian brothers who compete physically by fighting only, but uh, this pair of heroes, uh, besides being very skilled in fighting, uh, are also unbeatable in any kind of competition, for uh, they are skilled in fighting in armour, and they will teach the art uh, to anyone who pays them, uh, but they're also skilled in legal competition. Uh, they will plead themselves before the courts, and they will teach others to speak and compose speeches which will have an effect on the courts, and that that was only the beginning of their wisdom, Crito, because they have at last carried out the pancratiastic art to the very end, and have mastered uh, the only mode of fighting which had hitherto been neglected by them. And now no one dares to even stand up against them. Such is their skill, such is their skill, Crito, in the war of words, that they can refute any proposition, whether true or false. Now, I am thinking, Crito, of placing myself in their hands, for they say that in a short time uh, they can impart their skill to uh, anyone. <laughs> but, uh, Socrates, are you not too old? There, there may be reason to fear that. Certainly not, Crito, as I will prove to you, for I have the consolation here of knowing that they began this art of disputation which I covet quite, as you might say, in old age. Last year, or the year before, they had none of their new wisdom. I am, uh, I am only apprehensive that I may bring the two strangers into disrepute, as I have done Conus, the son of Metrobius, the harp player, who is still my music master, for when the boys who go to him for lessons see 
me going with them, they laugh at me and they call him a grandpapa's master. Now, I should not like these strangers to experience similar treatment. The fear of ridicule may make them unwilling to receive me. And th therefore, Crito, I shall try and persuade some old men to accompany with me to the... I shall try and persuade some old men to accompany me to them, <laughs> as I persuaded them to go with me to Conus, <laughs> and I hope that you, Crito, will make one of them. <laughs> and perhaps we'd better uh, take your sons as a bait. They will want to have them as pupils, and for the sake of them, be willing to receive us. I see no objection, Socrates, if you like, but f first, I wish that you would give me a description of their wisdom, that I, I may know beforehand what we are going to learn. Ha! Huh. <laughs> Great. In less than no time you shall hear, Crito, for I cannot say that I did not pay attention. I paid great attention to them, and I remember, and will endeavour to repeat the whole story. Providentially, I was sitting alone in the dressing room of the Lyceum, where you just saw me, and I was about to depart. I was getting up uh, when I recognised an omen that something interesting was about to happen. So I sat down again. And, in a little while, the two brothers, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus, came in, and several others with them, whom I believe to be their disciples. And they walked about in the covered court. They had not taken more than two or three turns when Clinias entered, who, as you truly say, is very much improved. He... Uh, was followed by a host of uh, lovers, one of whom was uh, Tessipus the Paeanian, a well-bred youth, but also having the wildness of youth. Anyway, Clinias saw me from the entrance, and as I was sitting alone, uh, at once uh, came and sat down on my right, as you describe, and Dionysodorus and Euthydemus, when they saw him, at first stopped and talked with one another, and now and then glancing at us, for I particularly watched them, and then Euthydemus came and sat down by the youth, and the other by me on the left-hand side, and the rest of them wherever. I greeted the brothers, whom I had not seen for a long time, and then I said to Clinias, I hear... Are these two wise men, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus, Clinias? They are wise not in a small, but in a large amount of wisdom, for they know all about war, everything that a good general needs to know about the uh, arrangement and command of an army, and uh, they know the whole art of fighting in armour, and they know about the law too, and they can teach a man how to uh, use the weapons of the courts when he needs. They heard me say this, the brothers, uh, but they rather looked down on me. I observed that they, they looked at one another, and both of them laughed. And then Euthydemus said, Those, Socrates, are matters which we no longer pursue seriously. To us, they are... Secondary occupations. Indeed, I said. If such occupations are regarded by you as secondary, what must the principal one be? Tell me. I beseech you, Euthydemus, what, what that noble study is. The teaching of virtue, Socrates, he replied is our principal occupation, 
and we believe that we can impart it better and quicker than any man. My God, I said, and uh, where did you learn that? I always thought, as I was saying just now, that your chief accomplishment was uh, the art of fighting in armour, and I used to say as much about you. For I remember that you said that when you were here before, um, that you said that. Uh, that you were very good at fighting in armour. But now, uh, if you really have the other knowledge, uh, do forgive me, Euthydemus. <laughs> in that case, I address you as I would superior beings, and ask you to pardon the impiety of my former expressions. But uh, are you quite sure about this, Dionysodorus and Euthydemus? The promise is so vast that a, a feeling of incredulity steals over me. You may take our word, Socrates, for the fact. Then I think you happier in having such a treasure than the great king is in the possession of his kingdom. And please, uh, to tell me uh, whether you, uh, you intend to exhibit your wisdom, or what will you do? That is why we have come hither, Socrates, and our purpose is not only to exhibit, but also to teach anyone who likes to learn. But I can promise you, I said, that every unvirtuous person will want to learn. I shall be the first. And there is the youth, Clinias, and uh, Tessipus here, and several others, I said, uh, pointing to the, the lovers of Clinias who were beginning to gather around us. Now, Tessipus uh, was sitting at some distance from Clinias, and when Euthydemus leaned forward in talking with me, he was, present he was prevented from seeing Clinias, who was between us. And so, uh, partly uh, because he wanted to look at Clinias, and also because he was interested, he jumped up and stood opposite to us, and all the other admirers of Clinias, as well as the disciples of Euthydemus and Dionysodorus, followed, he's followed his example. And these were the people whom I showed to Euthydemus, telling him that uh, they were all eager to learn, to which Tessipus and all of them, uh, with one voice, vehemently assented, and bid him exhibit the power of his wisdom. Then I said, Oh, uh, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus, I earnestly request you to do myself and the company the favour to exhibit. There may be some trouble in giving the whole exhibition, I guess, but tell me one thing. Can you make a good man of him only who is already convinced that he ought to learn from you, or of him also who is not convinced, either because he imagines that virtue is a thing which cannot be taught at all, or that you are not the teachers of it? Has your art the power to persuade him, who is of the latter temper of mind, that virtue can be taught, and that you are the men from whom he will best learn it? Certainly, Socrates, said Dionysodorus. Our art will do both. Ah, and you and your brother, Dionysodorus, I said of all men who are now living, are the most likely to stimulate him to philosophy and to the study of virtue. Yes, Socrates, I rather think we are. Aha, then, I wish that you would be so good as to defer the other part of the exhibition and only try to persuade the youth whom you see here that he ought to be a philosopher and study virtue. Exhibit that, and you will confer a great favour on me, and on everyone present, 
for the fact is I and all of us are extremely anxious that he should become truly good. His name is Kleinias, and he is the son of Axiochus, and grandson of the old Alcibiades, a cousin of the Alcibiades that now is. He is quite young, and we are naturally afraid that someone may get the start on us, and turn his mind in a wrong direction, and he may be ruined. Your visit, therefore, is most happily timed, and I hope that you will make a trial of the young man, and converse with him in our presence, uh, if you have no objection. These were uh, pretty nearly the expressions which I used, Crito, and Euthydemus, in uh, a manly and at the same time encouraging tone, replied, There can be no objection, Socrates, if the young man is only willing to answer questions. Oh, he's uh, quite accustomed to do so, I replied, for his friends often come and ask him questions, and ask and argue with him, and therefore he is quite at home in answering. Now, what followed, Crito, how can I rightly narrate? For not slight is the task of rehearsing infinite wisdom, and therefore, like the poets, I ought to commence my relation with an, an invocation to memory and to the muses. Now, Euthydemus, if I remember rightly, began uh, nearly uh, as follows. O Clinias, are those who learn the wise or the ignorant? Uh, the youth, uh, overpowered by the question, blushed, and in his perplexity looked at me uh, for help. And I, uh, knowing that he was disconcerted, said, Take courage, Clinias, and answer like a man, whichever you think, uh, for my belief is that you will derive the greatest benefit from their questions. Whichever he answers, said Dionysodorus, leaning forwards so as to catch my ear, his face beaming with laughter, I prophesy that he will be refuted, Socrates. Now, while Dionysodorus was speaking to me, Clinias gave his answer, and therefore I had no time to warn him of the predicament in which he was placed, and he answered that those who learned were the wise. Euthydemus proceeded. There are some whom you would call teachers, are there not? Uh, the boy agreed. And they are the teachers of those who learn. The grammar master and the lyre master used to teach you and other boys, and you were the learners. Yes. And when you were the learners, you did not as yet know the things which you were learning. No, he said. And were you wise then? No, indeed, he answered. But if you were not wise, you were unlearned. Certainly. You then, learning what you did not know, were unlearned when you were learning. The youth nodded his agreement. Then the unlearned learn, and not the wise, Clinias, as you imagine. At these words, the Followers of Euthydemus, of whom I spoke, like a chorus at the bidding of the director, laughed and cheered. Then, uh, before the youth had time to recover his breath, Dionysodorus cleverly took him in hand and said, Yes, Clinias, and when the grammar master dictated anything to you, were, there, were they the wise boys or the unlearned who learned the dictation? The wise replied Clinias. Then, after all, the wise are the learners, and not the unlearned, and your last answer to Euthydemus was wrong. Uh, 
And then, once more, the admirers of the two heroes, in an ecstasy at their wisdom, gave vent to another blast of laughter, while the rest of us were silent and amazed. Euthydemus, observing this, determined to persevere with the youth, and in order to heighten the effect, went on asking another similar question, which might be compared to the double turn of an expert dancer. "'Do those,' said he, "'who learn, learn what they know, or what they do not know?' Again Dionysodorus whispered to me, that, Socrates, is just another of the same sort. Good heavens, I said, and your last question was so good. Like all of our questions, Socrates, he replied, inevitable. I see the reason, I said, why you are in such reputation among your disciples. Meanwhile, Clinias had answered Euthydemus that those who learned, learned what they do not know, and he put him through a series of questions the same as before. Do you not know letters? Uh, Clinias assented. All letters? Yes. But when the teacher dictates to you, does he not dictate letters? To this, Clinias also agreed. Then, if you know all letters, he dictates that which you know. This again was admitted by Clinias. Then, said Euthydemus, you do not learn that which he dictates, but he only who does not know letters learns. No, said Clinias, but I do learn. Then, said he, you learn what you know, if you know all the letters. Clinias admitted that. Then, said Euthydemus, you were wrong in your answer. The word was hardly out of his mouth, when Dionysodorus took up the argument, like a bull which he caught, and had another throw at the youth. Clinias, he said, Euthydemus is deceiving you, for tell me now, is not learning acquiring knowledge of that which one learns? Clinias agreed. And knowing is having knowledge at the time. Clinias agreed. And not knowing is not having knowledge at the time. He admitted that. And are those who acquire those who have or have not a thing? Those who have not. And have you not admitted that those who do not know are of the number of those who have not. He nodded assent. Then those who learn are of the class of those who acquire, and not of those who have. He agreed. Then, Clinias, he said, those who do not know learn, and not those who know. Euthydemus was at this point proceeding to give Clinias a third fall, but I knew he was in pretty deep water, and therefore, as I wanted to give him a break, lest he should be disheartened, I said to him consolingly, Oh, you uh, must not be surprised, Clinias, at the singular mode of their speech. This I say because you may not understand what the two strangers are doing with you, they are only initiating you after the manner of the Corribantes in the Mysteries. And this answers to the enthronement, which, if you have ever been initiated, is, as you will know, uh, accompanied by dancing and sport. And now they are just uh, prancing and dancing about you, 
and will next proceed to initiate you in the mysteries. Imagine uh, that you have gone through the first part of the sophistical ritual, which, as uh, Prodicus says, uh, begins with initiation into the correct use of terms. The two foreign gentlemen, perceiving that you did not know, wanted to explain to you that the word to learn has two different meanings, and is used first in the sense of acquiring knowledge of some matters of which you previously had no knowledge, and also when you have the knowledge in the sense of reviewing the knowledge, uh, whether something done or spoken by the light of this newly acquired knowledge, the latter is generally called knowing rather than learning, but the word learning is also used, and you did not see, as they explained to you, uh, that the term is employed of two opposite sorts of men, of those who know and of those who do not know. Uh, there was a similar trick in the second question, when they asked you whether men learn what they know or what they do not know. Now, these questions are not serious, and that's why I say the gentlemen are not serious. At the moment, they are only playing with you. For uh, if a man did have all of that sort of knowledge that ever was, he still would not be at all the wiser. Uh, he would only be able to uh, play with us and uh, trip us up and occasionally overset us with distinctions of words. Uh, he would be like a person who uh, pulls away a stool from one of his friends who is about to sit down and then laughs and uh, makes merry at the sight of his friend overturned and laid on his back. Anyway, you must regard all that has hitherto passed between you and them as merely play. Uh, but in what is to follow, I am certain uh, that they will exhibit to you their serious purpose, and keep their promise. For they promised uh, to give me a sample of the hortatory philosophy. But I suppose they wanted to have a game with you first. And now, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus, I think uh, that we've had enough of this. Will you let me see you explaining to the young man how he is to apply himself to the study of virtue and wisdom? And I will uh, first show you what I conceive to be the nature of the task, and what sort of a discourse I desire to hear. And if I do this in a very inartistic and ridiculous manner, don't laugh at me, for I only venture to improvise before you, because... I am eager to hear your wisdom, and I must therefore ask you and your disciples to, to refrain from laughing. Now, O son of Axiochus, let me put a question to you. Do not all men desire happiness? And yet, uh, perhaps, uh, this is one of the ridiculous questions which I am afraid to ask, and which ought not to be asked by a sensible man, for what human is there who does not desire happiness? There is no one, said Clonias, who does not. Well then, I said, since we all of us desire happiness, how can we be happy? That is the next question. Shall we not be happy if we have many good things? And this, uh, perhaps, is even a more simple question than the first, for there can be no doubt of the answer. He assented. And what things do we esteem good? No uh, clever sage is required to tell us this. It can be easily answered, for everyone will say that uh, wealth is a good. Certainly, he said. And... Are not health and beauty goods and other personal gifts or talents? He agreed. Uh, can there be any doubt that good birth and power and uh, honours in one's land are goods? He assented. And uh, what other goods are there? I said. What do you say of temperance, justice? courage, 
Uh, do you not verily and indeed think, Tlinaeus, that uh, we shall be more right in ranking them as goods than in not ranking them as goods? For a dispute might possibly arise about this. Uh, what then do you say? Oh, uh, they are goods, said Tlinaeus. Very well, I said, and where? In the company shall we find a place for wisdom, among the goods or not? Among the goods? And now, I said, think whether we have left out any considerable goods. Ah, uh, I do not think that we have, said Tlinaeus. Ah, on recollection, I said, indeed I am afraid that we have left out the greatest good of them all. What is that? he asked. Fortune, Tlinaeus, I replied, which all, even the most foolish, admit to be the greatest of goods. True, he said. On second thoughts, I added, uh, how narrowly, Tlinaeus, have you and I escaped making a laughing stock of ourselves in front of the strangers? Why do you say so? Well, because we have already spoken of good fortune, but we are repeating ourselves. Uh, what do you mean? I mean... That there is something ridiculous in again putting forward good fortune, which had a place in the list already, and saying it again twice over. He asked, what was the meaning of this? And I replied, surely wisdom is good fortune. Even a kid would know that. And the young man was amazed. And uh, observing his surprise, I said to him, Well, do you not know, Tlinaeus, that flute players are most fortunate and successful in terms of performing on the flute? He assented. And are not scribes most fortunate in writing and reading letters? Certainly. Uh, amid the dangers of the sea, again, is anyone more fortunate on the whole than a wise pilot? None, certainly. And if you were engaged in a war, in whose company would you rather take the risk? In company with a wise general, or with a foolish one? Yeah, with a wise one. And if you were ill, whom would you rather have as a companion in a dangerous illness? A wise physician, or... An ignorant one. A wise one. You think that to act with a wise man is more fortunate than to act with an ignorant one, he assented. Then wisdom always makes men fortunate, for by wisdom no man would ever err, and therefore he must act rightly and succeed, or his wisdom would not be wisdom. Now, Crito, we contrived at last, somehow or other, to agree in a general conclusion that he who had wisdom had no need of fortune. But then I recalled to his mind the previous state of the question. You remember, I said, our making the admission that we'd be, we should be happy and fortunate if many good things were present with us. He assented. And... Should we be happy by reason of the presence of good things, if they profited us not, or if they profited us? Uh, if they profited us, he said. And would they profit us if we only had them and did not use them? For example, if we had a great deal of food but did not eat, or a great deal of drink and did not drink, should we be profited? Certainly not, he said. 
or would an artisan who had all the implements necessary for his work and did not use them be any the better for the possession of them? For example, would a carpenter be any better for having all his tools and plenty of wood if he never worked? Certainly not, he said. And if a person had wealth and all the goods which we were just now speaking of and did not use them, would he be happy because he possessed them? No, indeed, Socrates. Then, I said, a man who would be happy must not only have the good things, but he must also use them. There is no advantage in merely having them. True? Well, Tlinias, but if you have the use as well as the possession of good things, is that sufficient to confer happiness? Yes, in my opinion. And may a person use them either rightly or wrongly? Oh, uh, he must use them rightly. That's quite true, I said, and the wrong use of a thing is far worse than the non-use, because one is an evil, the other is neither a good nor an evil. You admit that? He assented. Now, in the working and use of wood, is not that which gives the right use simply the knowledge of the carpenter? Nothing else, he said. And surely in the manufacture of vessels, knowledge is that which gives the right way of making them, he agreed. And in the use of goods of which we spoke at first, wealth and health and beauty, is not knowledge that which directs us to the right use of them and regulates our practice about them, he assented again. Then, in every possession and every use of a thing, knowledge is that which gives a man not only good fortune, but success. He again assented. And tell me, I said, tell me, what do possessions profit a man if he have neither good sense nor wisdom? Would a man be better off having and doing many things without wisdom, or a few things with wisdom? Look at the matter yet thus. If he did fewer things, would he not make fewer mistakes? If he made fewer mistakes, would he not have fewer misfortunes? And if he had fewer misfortunes, would he not be less miserable? Certainly. And who would do the least? A poor man or a rich man? Uh, a poor man. A weak man or a strong man? A weak man. A noble man or a mean man? Oh, a mean man. And a coward would do less than a courageous and temperate man? Yes. And an indolent man less than an active man? He assented. And a slow man less than a quick, and one who had dull perceptions of seeing and hearing less than one who had keen eyesight and hearing. All this was uh, mutually allowed by us. Then, I said, Clinias, the sum of the matter appears to be that the goods of which we spoke before are not to be regarded as goods in themselves, but the degree of good and evil in them depends on whether they are or are not under the guidance of knowledge. Under the guidance of ignorance, they are greater evils than their opposites, inasmuch as they are more able to minister to the evil principle which rules them. And when under the guidance of wisdom and prudence, they are greater goods, but in themselves they are nothing. That, he replied, is obvious. What, then, is the result of what has been said? Is not this the result, that other things are indifferent, and that wisdom is the only good, and ignorance the only evil? Yes, he assented. Great. 
let us consider a further point. Seeing that all men desire happiness, and happiness, as has been shown, is gained by a use, and a right use, of the things of life, and the right use of them, and good fortune in the use of them, is given by knowledge, the inference is that everybody ought, by all means, to try and make himself as wise as he can. Yes, he said. And when a man thinks that he ought to obtain this treasure, far more than money, from a father or a guardian or a friend or suitor, whether citizen or stranger, the eager desire and prayer to them that they would impart wisdom to you is not at all dishonourable, Clinias, nor is any one to be blamed for doing any honourable service or ministration to any man, uh, whether a friend or not, if his aim is to get wisdom. Do you agree? I asked. Yes, he said. I quite agree, and I think that you are right. Yes, I said. Clonius, if only wisdom can be taught and does not come to man spontaneously, for this is a point which has still to be considered and is not yet agreed upon by you and me. But I think, Socrates, that wisdom can be taught, he said. Ha 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 ha! Good man, I said. I'm delighted to hear you say so, and I am also grateful to you for having saved me from a long and tiresome investigation as to whether wisdom can be taught or not. But now, as you think that wisdom can be taught, and that wisdom only can make a man happy and fortunate, will you not acknowledge that all of us ought to love wisdom, and you individually will try to love her? Certainly, Socrates. I will do my best. I was uh, pretty pleased at hearing this, and I turned to Dionysodorus and Euthydemus and said, That is an example, clumsy and tedious, I admit, of the sort of exhortations which I would have you give, and I hope that one of you will set forth what I have been saying in a more artistic style, or at least take up the inquiry where I left off, and proceed to show the youth whether he should have all knowledge, or whether there is one sort of knowledge only which will make him good and happy. And what that is, for, as I was saying at first, the improvement of this young man in virtue and wisdom is a matter which we have very much at heart. Thus I spoke, Crito, and was all attention to what was coming. I wanted to see how they would approach the question, and where they would start in their exhortation to the young man that he should practice wisdom and virtue. Dionysodorus, who was the elder, spoke first. Everybody's eyes were directed towards him, perceiving that something wonderful might shortly be expected, and certainly they were not far wrong, for the man, Crito, began a remarkable discourse, well worth hearing, and wonderfully persuasive, regarded as an exhortation to virtue. "'Tell me,' he said, "'Socrates and the rest of you, who say that you want this young man to become wise, are you in jest, or in real earnest?" I was led by this, Crito, to imagine that Euthydemus and Dionysodorus fancied us to have been joking when we asked them to converse with young Clinias, and this had made them joke and play. Now, being under this impression, I was all the more decided in reiterating that we were indeed in profound earnest. Dionysodorus said, Ah, reflect, 
Socrates, you may have to deny your words. I have reflected, I said, and I shall never deny my words. Well, said he, and so you say that you wish Linnaeus to become wise. Undoubtedly. And yet, is he not wise as yet? Ah, at least his modesty will not allow him to say that he is. You wish him, then, he said, to become wise and not to be ignorant. Uh, that we do. You wish him, then, to be what he is not, and no longer to be what he is. Ah, I was uh, thrown into consternation at this, taking advantage of my constant, constant, bleh. taking advantage of my consternation. He added, "You wish him to no longer be what he is, which can only mean that you wish him to perish. Some friend you must be who want your." favourite person not to be, or to perish. Now, when Tessipus heard this, he got uh, very angry, as a good friend well might, and said, I say, stranger from Thurii, if politeness would allow me, I should say, a plague upon you. What can make you tell such a lie about me and the others, which I hardly like to repeat, as that I wish Clinaeus to perish? Euthydemus replied, And do you think, Tessipus, that it is possible to tell a lie? Yes, said Tessipus. I should be mad to say anything else. And in telling a lie, do you tell the thing of which you speak, or not? Uh, you tell the thing of which you speak. And he who tells, tells that thing which he tells, and no other. Yes? And that is a distinct thing apart from all other things. Certainly. And he who says that thing, says that which is. Yes? And he who says that which is, says the truth. And therefore, Dionysodorus, if he says that which is, says the truth of you, and no lie. Ye yes, Euthydemus, said Tessipus. But in saying this, he says what is not. Euthydemus answered, and that which is not, is not. True. And that which is not, is nowhere. Nowhere. And can any one do anything about that which has no existence, or do to Clinias that which is not, and is nowhere? I think not, said Tessipus. Well, but do rhetoricians, when they speak in assembly, do nothing? Uh, no, he said. They do something. And doing is making. Yes. And speaking is doing and making. He agreed. Then no one says that which is not, for in saying what is not he would be doing something. And you have already acknowledged but that no one can do what is not, and therefore, upon your own showing, no one says what is false, but if Dionysodorus says anything, he says what is true and what is. Ah, uh, yes, Euthydemus, said Tessipus, but he, th but he speaks of things in a certain way and manner, and uh, not as they really are. Why, Tessipus, said Dionysodorus, do you mean to say that any one speaks of things as they are? 
Yes, rather, said Tessipus, all gentlemen and truth-speaking persons. And are not good things good, and evil things evil? Of course. And you say that gentlemen speak of things as they are? Yes. Then the good speak evil of evil things, if they speak of them as they are? Yes, indeed. And they speak evil of evil men. And if I may give you a piece of advice, you had better take care that they do not speak evil of you, since I can tell you that the good speak evil of the evil. And do they speak great things of the great? rejoined Euthydemus, and warm things of the warm? They certainly do, said Tessipus, and they speak coldly of the insipid and cold dialectician. You, you are abusive, Tessipus, said Dionysodorus. You are abusive. Indeed I'm not, Dionysodorus, he replied, for I I respect you, and I'm giving you friendly advice, and if I could, I would persuade you not to lie like a bore to say in my presence that I desire, my friend, whom I value among all men, uh, to perish. I could see they were getting exasperated with one another, Crito, so I made a, a joke, and I said, uh, Ah, Tessipus, I think uh, we must allow the strangers to use language in their own way, and not quarrel with them about words, uh, but be thankful for what they give us. If they know how to destroy men in such a way as to make good and sensible men out of bad and foolish men, <laughs> whether this is a discovery of their own, or, or whether they've learned it from someone else, this new kind of destruction, uh, which enables them to get rid of a bad man and turn him into a good one, if they know this... And they do know this, at any rate they just now said that this was the secret of their newly discovered art. Let them, in their phraseology, destroy the youth and make him wise, and all of us with him. But if uh, you young men do not like to trust yourselves with them, then uh, fiat experimentum in corpore sinis. Uh, I shall be the volunteer on whom they shall operate. Uh, so here I, I offer up my old person to Dionysodorus. He may put me into the pot like Medea the Colchian. Uh, boil me up, if only he will make me good. Tessipus says, Ah, and I, Socrates, am ready to commit myself to the strangers. They may skin me alive, if they please, and I'm pretty well skinned by them already. If only my skin is made at last, not like that of the Marisai, Marsias, into a leather bottle, but into a piece of virtue. And here is Dionysodorus fancying that I'm angry with him, when really I'm not angry at all. But I do contradict him when I think that he is speaking improperly to me. You must not confound abuse and contradiction, O illustrious Dionysodorus, for they're quite different things. Contradiction, said Dionysodorus. Why, there never was such a thing. Certainly there is, he replied. There can be no question of that. Do you, Dionysodorus, maintain that there is not? You will never prove to me, he said, that you have heard anyone contradicting anyone else. <laughs> Indeed, said Tisiphus. Then you may now hear me contradicting you. Are you prepared to make that good? Certainly. Well, have not all things words expressive of them? Yes, of their existence or of their non-existence? Of their existence. Yes, Tessipus. And we just now proved, as you may remember, that no man could affirm a negative, for no one could affirm that which is not. And uh, what does that signify? said Tessipus. Even I may contradict all the same for that. 
But can we contradict one another? said Dionysodorus, when both of us are describing the same thing. Then we must surely be speaking the same thing. Tessipus assented. Or when neither of us is speaking of the same thing, for then neither of us says a word about the thing at all. Uh, he granted that proposition also. But when I describe something and you describe another thing, or I say something and you say nothing, is there any contradiction? How can he who speaks contradict him who speaks not? Here, Tessipus was silent, and I, in my astonishment, said, uh, What do you mean, Dionysodorus? I've often heard, and have been amazed to hear, this thesis of yours, which is maintained and employed by the disciples of Protagoras and others before them, and which to me appears quite uh, fantastical and suicidal as well as destructive. And I think that I'm most likely to hear the truth about it from you. This dictum is that there is no such thing as a falsehood. A man must either say what is true or say nothing. Uh, is that not your position? He assented. But if he cannot speak falsely, he also cannot think falsely. No, he cannot. Then there is no such thing as false opinion. No, he said. Then there is no such thing as ignorance, or men who are ignorant, for is not ignorance, if there be such a thing, a mistake of fact? Certainly. And that is impossible? Impossible, he replied. Right. Are you saying this as a paradox, Dionysodorus, or do you seriously maintain no man to be ignorant? Refute me. Ah. How can I refute you if, as you say, to tell a falsehood is impossible? Very true, said Euthydemus. Neither did I tell you just now to refute me, said Dionysodorus, for how can I tell you to do that which is not? Ah, Euthydemus, I said, I have but a dull concept of these subtleties and excellent devices of wisdom. I am afraid that I hardly understand them, and you must forgive me, therefore, if I ask a very stupid question. If there be no falsehood or false opinion or ignorance, there can be no such thing as erroneous action, for a man cannot fail of acting as he is acting. That is what you mean. Yes, he replied. Okay, and now... I will ask my stupid question. If there is no such thing as error in deed, word, or thought, then what, in the name of Zeus, uh, do you come here to teach? Were you not just now saying that you could teach virtue best of all men uh, to anyone who was willing to learn? Ha <laughs> ha! Are you such an old fool, Socrates? replied Dionysodorus, are that you bring up now what I said at first? And if I'd said anything last year, I suppose you'd try to bring up that up too. But are nonplussed at the words which I have just uttered. Yes, well, I said, they're not easy to answer, Dionysodorus, therefore uh, they are the words of such wise men. And indeed, I know not what to make of this word nonplussed, which you just used. Uh, what do you mean by it? Uh, you must mean that I cannot refute your argument. Uh, tell me if, if the words have any other sense. No, 
he replied. They mean what you say, and no answer. What? Before you, Dionysodorus, I said. Answer, said he. Is that uh, fair? Yes, quite fair, he said. Oh, okay. Upon what principle? I said. I can only suppose that you're a very wise man who comes to us in the character of a great logician, and who knows when to answer and when not to answer. And now you will not open your mouth at all, because you know that you ought not. You chatter, he said, instead of answering. But if, my good sir, you admit that I am wise, answer as I tell you. Ah, I suppose that I must obey then, for uh, you are the master logician. Uh, put the question. Are the things which have sense alive or lifeless? Uh, they are alive. And do you know of any word which is alive? I cannot say that I do. Then why did you ask me what sense my words had? Why? Uh, possibly because I was stupid and made a mistake. Uh, but possibly I was right after all in saying that words have sense. Right, what do you say of this, O oh wise man? If I was not in error, then even you will not refute me, and your wisdom will be nonplussed. But... If I did fall into error, then again, you are wrong in saying that there is no error. And this remark was made by you not quite a year ago. Ha! Ha! Uh, I am inclined to think, however, Dionysodorus and Euthydemus, that this argument lies where it was, and is not very likely to advance. Even your skill in the subtleties of logic, which is pretty amazing, has not found out the way of throwing another and not falling yourself, and now any more than of old. Ha! Tessipus said, Men of Chaos, Thurii, or however and whatever you want to call yourselves, I do wonder at you, for you seem to have no objection to talking nonsense. Fearing that there might be high words, I again endeavoured to soothe Tessipus, Crito, and I said to him, Ah, Tessipus, I must repeat what I said before to Clinias, that you don't understand the ways of these philosophers from abroad. They are not serious, but like the Egyptian wizard Proteus, they take different forms and deceive us with their enchantments. Uh, let us, like Menelaus, refuse to let them go until they show themselves to us in earnest. When they begin to be in earnest, their full quality will appear. Let us then beg and entreat and beseech them to shine forth. And I think I'd better once more exhibit the form in which I pray to behold them. It, uh, it might be a guide to them. I will go on, therefore, where I left off as well as I can, in the hope that I may touch upon their hearts and move them to pity, and that when they see me deeply serious and interested, they may also become serious. So you, Clinias, I said, uh, shall remind me uh, at what point we left off. Uh, did we not agree that philosophy should be studied? Uh, was that not our conclusion? Yes, he replied. Aha, and uh, philosophy is the acquisition of knowledge. Yeah. And what knowledge ought we to acquire? Uh, may we not uh, answer this with absolute truth? It is knowledge which will do us good. Certainly, Socrates, he said. And should we be any the better if we went about having a knowledge of the places where most gold was hidden in the earth? Ah, well, perhaps we should. 
he said. Ah, but have we not already proved, I said, that we should be none the better off, even if, without trouble and digging, all the gold which there is in the earth were ours, and if we knew how to convert stone into gold, uh, the knowledge would be no value to us, unless we also knew how to use the gold. Uh, do you not remember that bit? I asked. Oh, I, I quite remember, Socrates. Good. Nor would any other knowledge, whether of uh, money-making, or of medicine, or of any art which knows only how to make a thing and not how to use it when made, be of any good to us. Am I not right? He agreed. And if there was a knowledge which was able to make men immortal, uh, without giving them the knowledge of the way to use the immortality, neither would there be any use in that, if we may argue from the analogy of the previous instances. Uh, to all of this, uh, he agreed. <laughs> so, Kleinia, so the knowledge which we want is knowledge which uses as well as makes. True? he said, and our desire is not to be skilful liar-makers or artists of that type, uh, far otherwise, for with them the art which makes is one, and the art which uses is another. Although they have to do with the same, they are divided, for the art which makes and the art which plays on the lyre differ widely from one another. Am I right? He agreed. And clearly, we do not want the art of the flute-maker, that is only another of the same sort. Yeah, but suppose I said that we were to learn the art of making speeches, would that be the art which would make us happy? I should say no, said Clonaeus. Ah, oh, well, uh, why, why should you say so? I asked. Well, I see, he replied, <laughs> that there are some composers of speeches who do not know how to use the speeches which they make, just just like the uh, makers of lyres do not know how to use the lyres, and also some who are of themselves unable to compose speeches, but are able to use the speeches which the others make for them. And this proves that the art of making speeches is not the same as the art of using them. Yes, I said, and I take your words to be sufficient proof that the art of making speeches is not one uh, which will make you happy. And yet I did think that the art which we have so long been seeking might be discovered in that sort of direction, for the composers of speeches, whenever I meet them, always appear to me to be very extraordinary men, Tlandias, and their art does seem lofty and divine, and no wonder. For this speech-making is a part of the great art of enchantment, and hardly, if at all, inferior to it. And whereas the art of the enchanter is a mode of charming snakes and spiders and scorpions and other monsters and pests, uh, this art of the speech-makers acts upon uh, other groups of men, like politicians, or experts, uh, and it, it charms and pacifies them. Uh, do, do you agree with me, Tlinaeus? Ah, uh, yeah, I think that you're quite right. Uh, where shall we go, then, I said, and to what art shall we have recourse? Uh, I don't know he said. Ah, but I think that I do. Ah, uh, what's your idea, then? asked Tlinaeus. I think that the art of the military general is, above all others, the one of which the possession is most likely to make a man happy. Ah, I don't think so, he said. Huh? Why not? I asked. Well, the art of the general is 
surely an art of uh, hunting mankind. Yeah? What of that? I said. Well, he said, no art of hunting extends beyond hunting and capturing, and when the prey is taken, the huntsman or fisherman cannot use it, uh, but they have to hand it over to the cook, and the geometricians and astronomers and the calculators, who all belong to the hunting class, for they do not make their diagrams, but only find out that which was previously contained in them. They, I say, not being able to use but only to catch their prey, hand over their inventions to the dialectician to be applied by him, if they have any sense in them. Yeah, yeah, pretty good, I said. Uh, ah, you clever chap, Clynius, you. Uh, I wonder if, if this is true, this line of reasoning. Certainly, he said, just as a general, when he takes a city or a camp, hands over his new acquisitions to the statesman, for he does not know how to use them himself, or as the quail-taker transfers the quails to the keeper of them, if we are looking for the art which is to make us blessed, and which is able to use that which it makes or takes, the art of the military general is not the one, and some other must be found. Socrates, do you mean the young kid said all this? Uh, are you are you disbelieving my story, Crito? Indeed I am. For if he said so, Socrates, then in my opinion he needs neither Euthydemus nor anyone else to be his instructor. Uh, um, perhaps I may have forgotten... And uh, maybe Tessipus was the real answerer. Tessipus? Nonsense, Socrates. Well, all I know, Crito, is that I heard these words, and they were not spoken by either Euthydemus or Dionysodorus. I dare say, my good Crito, that they might have been spoken by some other superior person, uh, but that I heard them... Uh, I'm certain. Yes, indeed, Socrates, by someone a good deal superior, as I should be disposed to think. But did you carry the search any further? And did you find the art of which you were seeking? Uh, find? Uh, no, Crito. No, indeed. We cut a pretty poor figure. Uh, we were like kids chasing after larks, always on the point of catching the art, which was always getting away from us. But look, why should I bother repeating the whole story? At last we came to the kingly art, and inquired whether that gave and caused happiness, and then we got into a labyrinth, and when we thought we were at the end, came out again at the beginning, having still to seek as much as ever. Ah, oh, yes, how did that happen, Socrates? Ah, well, I shall tell you. Uh, the kingly art was identified by us uh, with the political Ah, well, that's pretty sensible. And uh, what came of that? Right. Well, to the political art, all the other arts, including the arts of the military general, seemed to render up the supremacy of being the only one which knew how to use what they produce. So, here... Obviously was the very art which we were seeking, the art which is the source of good government, and which may be described in the language of Aeschylus as alone sitting at the helm of the vessel of state, piloting and governing all things, and utilising them. Ah, so were you not right about that, Socrates? Ah, uh, you shall have to judge, Crito. If you are willing to hear what followed, for we resumed uh, the inquiry, and a question of this sort was asked, does the kingly art, having this supreme authority, do anything for us? Certainly, was the answer. And would not you, Crito, say the same? Ah, oh, yes, I, I should, Socrates. And... What would you say the kingly art does, if 
medicine were supposed to have supreme authority over the subordinate arts, and I were to ask you a similar question about that, you would say it produces health. Ah, I, I should, Socrates. And uh, what of your own art, Crito, of uh, agriculture, supposing that to have supreme authority over the lesser arts, what does that do? <laughs> does it not supply us with the fruits of the earth? Yes, Socrates. And what does the political art do when invested with supreme power? Uh, perhaps you may not be ready with an answer. Indeed, I am not, Socrates. No more than we, Crito. But at any rate, you know that if this is the art which we are seeking, it ought to be useful. Ah, certainly. And surely it ought to do us some good. Certainly, Socrates. And Clinias and I had arrived at the conclusion that knowledge of some kind is the only good. Ah, oh, yeah, that, 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 that is what you were saying, Socrates. And all the other results of politics, and there are many, as for example wealth and freedom and tranquillity, were neither good nor evil in themselves, but the political science ought to make us wise and impart knowledge to us, if that is the science which is likely to do us good and make us happy. Ah, uh, yes, that was the conclusion at which you had arrived, uh, according to your report of the conversation. And does the political art make men wise and good? Uh, why not, Socrates? What? All men, and in every respect, and teach them all the arts, carpentering and cobbling and the rest of them? I think not, Socrates. Uh, but then, what is this knowledge, and what are we to do with it? For it is not the source of any works which are neither good nor evil, and gives no knowledge, but the knowledge of itself. What, then, can it be, and what are we to do with it? Shall we say, Crito, that it is the knowledge by which we are to make other men good? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, by all means. And in what will they be good and useful? Shall we repeat that they will make others good, and that these others will make others again, without ever determining in what they are to be good? For we have put aside the results of politics, as they are called. This is the old, old song over again, and we are just as far from the end, if not further, from the knowledge of the art or science of happiness. Ah, oh, indeed, Socrates, you do appear to have got into a great perplexity. Yeah. Thereupon, Crito, seeing that I was on the point of a shipwreck, I lifted up my voice and earnestly entreated and called upon the strangers to save me and the youth from the whirlpool of the argument. They were our Castor and Pollux, I said and they should be serious and show us in sober earnest what the knowledge was which would enable us to pass the rest of our lives in happiness. Ah, and did Euthydemus show you this knowledge? Oh yes, indeed. He proceeded in a lofty strain to the following effect. Would you rather, Socrates, said he, that I show you this knowledge about which you have been doubting, or shall I prove that you already have it? What? I said. Are you blessed with such a power as this? Indeed, I am. Oh, well then, I'd much rather that you prove me to have such a knowledge already. <laughs> At my time of life, that's going to be much more agreeable than having to learn it. Then tell me, said he, do you know anything? 
Uh, yes, I said. I know many things, but not anything of much importance. That, that will do, he said. And would you admit that anything is what it is, and at the same time is not what it is? Uh, certainly not. And did you not say that you knew something? I did. And if you know, you are knowing. Uh, certainly of the knowledge which I have. That makes no difference. And must you not, if you are knowing, know all things? Certainly not, I said. For there are many other things which I do not know. And if you do not know, you are not knowing. Yes, Euthydemus, of that which I do not know. Still, you are not knowing, and you said just now that you were knowing, and therefore you are and are not at the same time, and in reference to the same things. Oh, my God, as they say, Euthydemus. Uh, this uh, scheme of yours, uh, will you explain... Now, how I possess that knowledge for which we were seeking, do you mean to say that the same thing cannot be and also not be, and therefore, since I know one thing that I know all, for I cannot be knowing and not knowing at the same time, and if I know all things, then I must have the knowledge for which we are seeking, may I assume this to be your ingenious notion? Out of your own mouth, Socrates, you are convinced! Well, but, Euthydemus, I said, has that never happened to you? For if I am only in the same case with you and our friend Dionysodorus, I cannot complain. Tell me then, uh, you two, do you, uh, do you not know some things and not know others? Certainly not, Socrates, said Dionysodorus. Uh, what do you mean, I said, do you know nothing? Nay, he replied, we do know something. Then I said, you know all things, if you know anything. Yes, all things, he said, and that is as true of you as of us. Oh, I said. Uh, what a wonderful thing, and what a splendid blessing. And do all other men know all things or nothing? Certainly, he replied. They cannot know some things and not know others, and be at the same time knowing and not knowing. Uh, then what is the inference? I said. They know all things, he replied, if they know one thing. Oh, God, Dionysodorus, I said, I see now that you are actually in earnest. Uh, hardly have I got you to that point. And do you really and truly know all things, including uh, carpentering and leather cutting? Certainly. And uh, do you know stitching? Yes, by the gods we do, and cobbling, too. And do you know things such as the numbers of the stars and of the sand? Certainly. Did you think that we should say no to that? I say, said Tisippus, interrupting, I only wish that you would give me some proof which would enable me to know whether you speak truly. What proof shall I give you? he said. Ha-ha! <laughs> will you tell me how many teeth Euthydemus has? And Euthydemus shall tell me how many teeth you have. Will you, will you not take our word that we know all things? Certainly not, said Tisippus. You must further tell us this one thing, and then we shall know that you speak the truth. Uh, if you tell us the number and we count them and you're found to be right, we will believe the rest. <laughs> they, uh, they decided 
Crito, that Tessipus was making a game of them, and they refused. They would only say, in answer to each of his questions, that they knew all things. For uh, at last, uh, Tessipus be began to throw off all restraint. No question, in fact, was too bad for him. He would ask them if they knew the, the foulest things. And they, like wild boars, came rushing on to his blows, fearlessly replying that they did. At last, Crito, I too was carried away by my incredulity, and asked uh, Euthydemus uh, whether Dionysodorus could dance. Certainly, he replied. And uh, can he vault among swords and turn on a wheel at, 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 at his age? Has he uh, got to such a height of skill as that? He can do anything, said Euthydemus. And uh, did you always know this? Always, he said. And uh, when you were kids, uh, it's just, just like... Very young? They both said that they did. And uh, this we could not uh, believe. So Euthydemus said, You are incredulous, Socrates! Yes, I said, and I might well be incredulous if I did not know you to be <laughs> such wise men. But if you will answer, he said, I will make you confess to similar marvels. Uh, well, I said, there is nothing that I should like better than to be self-convinced of these things, for if I really am a wise man, uh, which I never knew before, and you will prove to me that I know and have always known all of these things, well, nothing in life could possibly be a greater gain for me. Answer, then, he said. Ask, I said, and I will answer. Do you know something, Socrates, or nothing? Something, I said. And do you know with what you know, or with something else? Uh, with what I know, and I suppose that you mean with my soul. Ah, are you not ashamed, Socrates, of asking a question when you are asked one? Well... But then what am I to do? Uh, for I will do whatever you bid. Uh, when I do not know what you're asking, you tell me to answer nevertheless, and not to ask again. Why, you surely have some notion of my meaning, he said. Uh, yes, I replied. Well then, answer according to your notion of my meaning. Uh, yes, I said, but if the question which you ask in one sense is understood and answered by me in another, will that please you if I answer what is not to the point? That will please me very well, but will not please you equally well as I imagine. Well, I certainly would not like to answer unless I understand you, I said. You will not answer, he said. According to your view of the meaning, because you will be chuntering, and you are an ancient. <laughs> now, I saw he was getting angry with me for drawing distinctions when he wanted to catch me in the springs of his words. And I remember that uh, Conus was always angry with me too when I opposed him, and then he neglected me because he thought I was stupid, and as I was intending to go to Euthydemus as a pupil, I reflected that I had better let him have his way, as he might otherwise think me a blockhead and refused to teach me. So I said, Ah, oh, you're a far better dialectician than myself, Euthydemus, uh, for I've never really made a profession of the art, and therefore I'll do as you say. Uh, ask your questions once more, and I will uh, answer. Answer then, he said, Again, whether you know what you know with something, or with nothing. Yes, I said, I know uh, with my soul. The, ah, the man will answer more than the question. For 
I did not ask you, he said, with what you know, but whether you know with something. Ah, oh, again, through ignorance, Euthydemus, I have answered too much, uh, but I hope that you will forgive me. And now I will answer simply that I always know what I know with something. And is that something? He carried on. Always the same, or sometimes one thing, and sometimes another thing. Always, I replied. When I know, I know with this. Will, will you not cease adding to your answers? Yeah. My fear is that this word always may get us into trouble. You, perhaps, but certainly not us. And now answer. Do you always know with this? Always. Since I am required to withdraw the words when I know. You always know with this, or always knowing. You Do you know some things with this, and some things with something else, or do you know all things with this? Uh, all that I know, I replied, I know with this. There again, Socrates, he said, the addition is superfluous. Well then, I said, I will take away the words that I know. Nay, take nothing away, I desire no favours of you, but let me ask, would you be able to know all things if you did not know all things? Quite impossible. And now, he said, you may add on whatever you like, for you confess that you know all things. Uh, I suppose that's true, I said. If my qualification implied in the words that I know is not allowed to stand, and so I do know all things. And have you not admitted that you always know all things with that which you know, whether you make the addition of when you know them or not, for you have acknowledged that you have always and at once known all things, that is to say, when you were a child and at your birth, and when you were growing up and before you were born, and before the heaven and the earth existed, you knew all things, if you always know them, and I swear that you shall always continue to know all things, if I am of the mind to make you. Ah. Well, I hope that you will be of that mind, uh, Euthydemus. I said, if you are really speaking the truth, and yet I a little doubt your power to make good your words, unless you have the help of your brother Dionysodorus, then you may do it. Tell me now, both of you, for although in the main I cannot doubt that I really do know all things, when I am told so by men of your uh, prodigious wisdom, how can I say that I know such things, Euthydemus, as that the good are unjust? Come, do I know that, or not? Certainly you know that. What? Uh, what, what do I know? That the good are not unjust. Quite true, I said, and that I have always known, but the question is, where did I learn that the good are unjust? Nowhere, said Dionysodorus. Then, I said, I do not know this. You're ruining the argument, said Euthydemus to Dionysodorus. He will be proved not to know, and then, after all, he will be knowing and not knowing at the same time. Dionysodorus uh, blushed. I turned to the other one and said, Well, what do you think, Euthydemus? Does not your omniscient brother appear to you uh, to have made a mistake? What? replied Dionysodorus in a moment. Am I the brother of Euthydemus? 
Oh, good. Thereupon, I said, please do not interrupt, my good friend, or prevent Euthydemus from proving to me that I know the good to be unjust. Such a lesson you might at least allow me to learn. You are running away, Socrates, said Dionysodorus, and refusing to answer. Well, no wonder, I said, for I am not a match for one of you, and a fortiori, by even stronger force of argument, I must run away from the two of you. I am no Heracles, and even Heracles could not fight against the Hydra, uh, who was like a sophist, by the way, and had the cleverness to shoot up many new heads whenever one of them was cut off, uh, especially when... Uh, Heracles saw a second monster, the sea crab, who was also like a sophist, and uh, appeared to have newly arrived from a sea voyage, bearing down on him from the left, uh, opening its mouth and biting. Anyway, when that monster was growing troublesome, he called Iolus, his nephew, to his help, who ably did help him to defeat the monsters. But, anyway, if my Iolus, who is my brother, Patrocles, the statue-maker, uh, were to come, uh, he would only make a bad business worse. Ha! Huh. Well, now you have delivered yourself of this strain, said Dionysodorus, will you inform me whether, whether Iolus was the nephew of Heracles any more than he is yours? Yeah. Well, I suppose I better had on see you, Dionysodorus, I said, for you will insist on asking, so that I know already, uh, out of envy, in order to prevent me from learning the wisdom of Euthydemus. Then answer me, he said. Well then, I said, I can only reply that Iolus was not my nephew at all, but the nephew of Heracles, and his father was not my brother Patrocles, but if it please, who has a name rather like him, and was the brother of Heracles. And is Patrocles, he said, your brother? Yes, I said, he is my half-brother, the son of my mother, but not of my father. Then he is and is not your brother. Not by the same father, for... Chiridemus was his father, and mine was Sophroniscus. Ah, and was Sophroniscus a father, and Chiridemus also? Yes, the former was my father, and the latter his. Then, said Dionysodorus, Chiridemus is not a father. He's not my father. I said, but can a father be other than a father, or are you the same as a stone? Uh, I certainly do not think that I am the same as a stone, I said, though I am afraid that you may prove it to be the case. And are you not other than a stone? I am other than a stone. And being other than a stone, you are not a stone. And being other than gold, you are not gold. Very true. And so, Chiridemus, he said, being other than a father is not a father. Uh, I suppose he is not a father, I replied. For if, said Euthydemus, taking up the argument, Chiridemus is a father, then Sophroniscus, being other than a father, is not a father, and you, Socrates, are without a father. Tesippus here, taking up the argument, said, Ah, is not your father in the same case, for he is other than my father? Assuredly not, said Euthydemus. Then he is the same. He is the same. Well, I cannot say I like the connection, but is he only my father, Euthydemus, or is he the father of all other men? Of all other men, 
he replied. Do you suppose the same person to be a father and not a father? Certainly, I did imagine so, said Tessipus. And do you suppose that gold is not gold, or that a man is not a man? Well, they are not in pari materia, Euthydemus, said Tessipus. And you'd better take care, for it is monstrous to suppose that your father is the father of all. But he is, he replied. <laughs> what, of, uh, of men only, said Tessipus, or also of horses and all other animals? Of all, said Euthydemus. And uh, <laughs> your mother, too, is the mother of all. Yes, our mother, too. Uh, yes, and your mother has a progeny of sea urchins, then. Yes, and yours, said Euthydemus. And uh, gudgeons and puppies and pigs are your brothers. And yours, too. And your your dad is a dog. And so is yours, said Euthydemus. <laughs> if you will answer my questions, said Dionysodorus, I will soon extract the same admissions from you, Tessipus. You say that you have a dog. Oh, rather, a villain of one, said Tessipus. And he has puppies? Yes, and they're very like himself. And the dog is the father of them. Yes, I uh, certainly saw him with the mother of the puppies. And is he not yours? He certainly is. Dionysodorus. Then he is a father, and he is yours. Ergo, he is your father, and the puppies are your brothers. Let me ask you one question more, said Euthydemus, uh, quickly interposing. In order that Tessipus might not get in his word, uh, you, uh, you beat this dog. <laughs> uh, if rather I do, uh, and I only wish that I could beat you instead of him. Then... You beat your father, Euthydemus said. I should have far more reason to beat yours, said Tessipus. <laughs> what, uh, what, what could he have been thinking when he had such wise sons? I mean, uh, much good uh, this uh, father of yours and your, and your brothers the puppies has got out of this wisdom of yours. But neither he nor you, Tessipus, have any much need of good. <laughs> and have you no need, uh, Euthydemus? he said. Neither I nor any other man, for tell me now, Tessipus, if you think it good or evil for a man who is sick to drink medicine when he wants it, or to go to war armed rather than unarmed. Uh, good, I say. And yet I know that I'm going to be caught in one of your uh, puzzles. That he replied. You will discover, if you answer, since you admit medicine to be good for a man to drink when wanted, must it not be good for him to drink as much as possible when he takes his medicine? A cartload of hellebore uh, will not be too much for him. Tessipus said, uh, Quite so, Euthydemus. Th that is to say, if he who drinks is as big as the statue of Delphi. Uh, and seeing that in war to have arms is a good thing, he ought to have as many spears and shields as possible. Very true, uh, said Tessipus. And do you think, Euthydemus, that he ought to have one shield only and one spear? I do. And uh, would you arm uh, Gerion and Briarius in that way? I mean, uh, considering you and your uh, brother fight in armour, I thought uh, that you might have known better. Here, Euthydemus held his peace, but uh, Dionysodorus returned to the previous answer of Tessipus and said, Do you not think that the possession of gold is a good thing? Oh, yes, said Tessipus, and the more the better. And to have money everywhere, and always, is a good. <laughs> Certainly, a, a great good. And you admit gold to be a good? Certainly, 
And ought not a man, then, to have gold everywhere and always, and as much as possible in himself? And may he not be deemed the happiest of men who has three talents of gold in his belly, and a talent in his pate, and a, a stator of gold in either eye? Ah, uh, yes. You know the, uh, the Scythians say that uh, those who have gold filling up their skulls are the happiest and bravest of men. Uh, that's uh, another instance of your manner of speaking about the dog and the father, by the way. Uh, what is more extraordinary, these people drink out of their own skulls, as if from a cup, and they see the inside of them, and they, uh, they hold their own head in their hands. Ah! And do the Scythians and others see that which has the quality of vision, or that which has not? That which has the quality of vision, clearly. And do you also see that which has the quality of vision? Asked Euthydemus. Yes, I do. Then do you see our garments? Yes. Then our garments have the quality of vision. Uh -huh. They can see to any extent said Tessipus. What can they see? Nothing. But you may perhaps imagine that they do not see. And certainly, Euthydemus, you do seem to have been caught napping when you were not asleep, and that if it be possible to speak and say nothing, you are doing so. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> uh. Ah, ah, and may there not be a silence of the speaker? Impossible, said Tessipus. Or a speaking of the silent? Uh, that is still more impossible, he said. But when you speak of stones, wood, iron bars, do you not speak of the silent? Uh, not when I pass a metal forging uh, shop, for then the iron bars make a pretty loud noise and an outcry if they get touched, so that here uh, your wisdom is in fact strangely mistaken, Dionysodorus. Ah, please, however, to tell me how you can be silent when speaking. I thought, Crito, that Tessipus was uh, trying pretty hard here because Tlinius was present. Anyway. When you are silent, said Euthydemus, is there not a silence of all things? Yes. But if speaking things are included in all things, then the speaking are silent. What? said Tessipus. Then all things are not silent. Certainly not, said Euthydemus. Then, my good friend, do they all speak? Yes, those which speak. Ah, no, no, no said Tessipus, but the question which I ask is whether all things are silent or speak. Neither and both, said Dionysodorus, quickly interposing. I am sure that you will be nonplussed at that answer. Here Tessipus, as his manner was, burst into a roar of laughter. He said, that uh, brother of yours, Euthydemus, has got into a dilemma. Everything is over with him. This delighted Clinias, whose uh, laughter made Tessipus even ten times again as uproarious. But I cannot help thinking that the rogue Tessipus must have picked up his answer from the brothers, for there has been no wisdom like theirs in our time. Ah, uh, what are you laughing at, Clinias? I said, at uh, such a solemn and, <laughs> and beautiful uh, analysis. Why, Socrates, said Dionysodorus, did you ever see such a beautiful thing? Yes, Dionysodorus, I replied, I've seen uh, many. Were they other than the beautiful, or the same as the beautiful? No, I was actually in a quandary at having to answer this question, and I thought I was uh, served right for having opened my mouth at all at this point. I said, however, they are not the same as absolute beauty, but they have beauty present with each of them. 
Are you an ox? Because an ox is present with you? Or are you Dionysodorus? Because Dionysodorus is present with you? Oh, God forbid, I replied. But how, he said, by reason of one thing being present with another, will one thing be another? Oh, is that your difficulty? I said, for I was beginning to imitate the skill of speech on which my heart was set. Of course, he replied, I and all the world are in difficulty about the non-existent. Ah, what do you mean, Dionysodorus? I said, is not the honourable honourable and the base base? That, he says, is as I please. And do you please? Yes, he said. And you will admit that the same is the same and the other other, for surely the other is not the same. I should imagine that even a child will hardly deny the other to be other. But I think, Dionysodorus, that you must intentionally have missed the last question, for in general you and your brother seem to be good workmen in your own department, and to do the dialectician's business excellently well. What? said he. Is the business of a good workman? Tell me, in the first place, whose business is hammering? The smiths. And whose is the making of pots? Uh, the potters. And who has to kill and skin and mince and boil and roast? The cook, I said. And if a man does his business, he does rightly? Certainly. And the business of the cook is to cut up and skin. You have admitted that. Uh, yes, uh, I have admitted that, but you must not be too hard on me. Then, if someone were to kill, mince, boil, and roast the cook, he would do his business. And if he were to hammer the smith and make a pot of the potter, he would do their business. Poseidon, I said, this is the crown of wisdom. Uh, can I ever hope to have such a level of wisdom of my own? And would you be able, Socrates? to recognise this wisdom when it has become your own? Uh, certainly, I said, if you will allow me. What? he said. Do you think that you know what is your own? Uh, yes, I do. Subject to your correction, Dionysodorus, for you define the bottom and Euthydemus the top of all of my wisdom. Is not that which you would deem your own, that which you have in your own power, and which you are able to use as you would desire? For example, an ox or a sheep? Or would you not think that which you could sell and give and sacrifice to any god when you pleased would be your own, and that which you could not give or sell or sacrifice you would think not to be in your own power? Uh, yes, I said. I was sure that some sort of good would come out of the questions, which I was uh, impatient for him to get on with. Yes, such things, and such things only, are mine. Yes, he said. And what do you mean by animals living beings? Uh, yes, I said. You agree, then, that those animals only are yours, with which you have the power to do all these things, which I was just naming? I agree. Then, after a pause in which he seemed to be lost in the contemplation of something great, he said, uh, Tell me, Socrates, have you an ancestral Zeus? Uh, here, anticipating the final move, like a person caught in a net, who gives a desperate twist that he might get away, I said, uh, No, Dionysodorus, I have not. <laughs> what a miserable man you must be, then, he said. You are not an Athenian at all, if you have no ancestral gods or temples, or any other mark of gentlemanliness. No, Dionysodorus, I said, do not be harsh. Good words, if you please. In the way of religion, I have altars and temples, domestic and ancestral, 
and all that other Athenians have. Ah, and have not other Athenians, he said, an ancestral Zeus? Uh, that name, I explained, is not to be found among the Ionians, whether colonists or citizens of Athens. An ancestral Apollo there is, who is the father of Ion, and a family Zeus, and a Zeus guardian of the house, and an Athena guardian of the house, but the name of ancestral Zeus is unknown to us. Ah, no matter, said Dionysodorus, for you admit that you have Apollo, Zeus, and Athena. Certainly. And they are your gods, he said. Yeah, yes, yes, my gods and, and sort of ancestors. At any rate, they are yours, he said. Did you not admit that? I did. Uh, I said, uh, what's going to uh, happen to me? Ah! And are not these gods animals? For you admit that all things which have life are animals. And have not these gods life? They have life, I said. Then are they not animals? They are animals, I said. And you admitted that of animals those are yours which you could give away or sell or offer in sacrifice as you pleased. I did admit that, Euthydemus, and I have no way of escape. Well then, said he, if you admit that Zeus and the other gods are yours, can you sell them or give them away or do what you will with them, as you would with other animals? At this, I was uh, quite struck dumb, Crito, and I uh, lay on my back. Uh, Tessipus came to the rescue. I say, bravo, Heracles, brave words, he said. Bravo, Heracles, or is Heracles a bravo, said Dionysodorus. Poisidon, said Tessipus, what awful distinctions, I will have no more of them, the pair are invincible. Ah, Anyway, then, my dear Crito, there was universal applause of the speakers and their words. And what with laughing and the uh, clapping of hands and rejoicing, the two men were quite overpowered, for hitherto their partisans had only cheered at each successive hit, but now the company shouted with delight until the columns of the Lyceum returned the sound, seeming to sympathise with their good cheer. I was uh, so impressed myself that I gave a short speech in which I acknowledged that I'd never seen the like of these two, these uh, brothers' wisdom. I was their devoted servant, and I fell to praising and admiring their expertise. What marvellous dexterity of wit, I said, enabled you to acquire this great perfection in so short a time. There is much indeed to admire in your words, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus, but there is nothing that I admire more than your magnanimous disregard of any opinion, whether of the many or of the grave and respectable uh, elders. You regard only those who are like yourselves, and I do verily believe that there are pretty few who are like you and who would approve of uh, such arguments as these. The majority of mankind are so ignorant of the value of this sort of stuff, uh, they, they would be more ashamed of employing them in the refutation of others uh, than of being refuted by them. I, I must further express my approval of your kind and public-spirited denial of all differences, whether of good and evil, white or black, or any other. Uh, the result of which is that, as you say, every mouth is sewn up, uh, not excluding your own, which uh, graciously follows the examples of others. And thus all grounds of offence is taken away, 
But what appears to me to be more than all this is that this art and invention of yours has been so admirably contrived by you that in a very short time it can be imparted to anyone. Yeah, I observed that uh, Tessipus learned to imitate you in uh, no time. Now this quickness of attainment is an excellent thing, but at the same time I would advise you not to have any more public entertainments. There is a danger that uh, men might undervalue an art uh, which they have so easy an opportunity of acquiring. The exhibition would be the best of all if the discussion were confined to your two selves. But if there must be an audience, uh, let him only be present who is willing to pay a handsome fee. You should be careful. You be very careful of this, uh, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus, and if you are wise, you will also bid your disciples discourse with no man but you and themselves. For uh, what is rare is valuable, and water, which, as Pindar says, is the best of all things, is also the cheapest. And now I have uh, only to request that you will receive Clinias and me among your pupils. Such uh, such was the discussion, Crito, and after a few more words had passed between us, we went away. I hope uh, that you will come to them with me, since uh, they say that they are able to teach anyone who will give them money. Uh, no age or want of capacity is an impediment, and I must repeat one thing which they said, for your especial benefit, Crito, that the learning of their art yeah, does not at all interfere with the business of making money. <laughs> Truly, Socrates, though I am curious and ready to learn, yet I fear that I'm not like-minded with Euthydemus, uh, but uh, one of the other sort who, as you were saying, would rather be refuted by such arguments than use them in refutation of others. And though I may appear ridiculous in venturing to advise you, I think that you may as well hear what was said to me by a man of very considerable pretensions. He was a, a professor of legal oratory, who came away uh, from you while I was walking up and down. Crito, he said to me, are you giving no attention to these wise men? Uh, no, indeed, I said to him. I, I could not get within hearing of them. There was such a crowd. You were... Uh, would have heard something worth hearing if you had, he said. <laughs> oh, yeah, what was that? I said. Ah, uh, you would have heard the greatest masters of the art of rhetoric discoursing. Ah, oh, uh, well, what did you think of them? What did I think of them? Theirs was the sort of discourse which you might hear from men who were playing the fool and making a fuss about nothing. Uh, that was the expression which he used, Socrates. Surely, I said, philosophy is a charming thing. Charming, he said. What simplicity! Philosophy is not. And I think that if you had been present, you would have been ashamed of your friend, his Conduct was so very strange in placing himself at the mercy of men who care not what they say, and who fasten upon every word. And these, as I was telling you, are supposed to be the most eminent professors of their time. But the truth is, Crito, that the study itself and the men themselves are utterly ridiculous. Now, censure of the pursuit of philosophy, Socrates, whether coming from him or from others, appears to me to be undeserved. But uh, as to the impropriety of holding up public discussion with such men as Euthydemus and Dionysodorus there, I confess, in my opinion, he was in the right. Oh, Crito, they're, they're such marvellous men. Uh, but what was I going to say? First of all, uh, let me know. Uh, what uh, what manner of man was he who came up to you and uh, censured philosophy? Was he an orator who himself practices in the courts, or an instructor of orators who makes the speeches with which they do battle? Oh, he was uh, certainly not an orator, Socrates. And I doubt whether he has ever been into court, uh, but they say he knows the business and is a clever man. 
and composes uh, wonderful speeches. Ah, now I understand, Crito. He is one of an amphibious class. Uh, I was on the point of mentioning these people earlier. It's one of these people Prodicus describes as being on the border ground between philosophers and politicians. They think they are the wisest of all men, and that they are generally esteemed the wisest. Nothing, they think, but the rivalry of the philosophers stands in their way, and they are of the opinion that if they can prove the philosophers to be good for nothing, no one will dispute their title to the palm of wisdom. For they certainly like to think of themselves as the wisest, although they are apt to be mauled by Euthydemus and his friends uh, whenever they get hold of them in conversation. Anyway, the opinion which they entertain of their own wisdom is pretty natural, uh, for they have a certain amount of philosophy and a certain amount of political knowledge. So there is reason, therefore, in what they say, for they argue that they have just the right amount of both, and so they keep out of the way of all the risks and conflicts, and reap are the rewards of their expertise. Ha <laughs> uh, ha! What, uh, what do you say of them then, Socrates? There is uh, certainly something specious in that uh, notion of theirs. Uh, yes, Crito, there is in fact more speciousness than truth. Uh, they cannot be made to understand the nature of intermediates. For you see, all persons or things which are intermediate between two other things and participate in both of them, if one of these two things is good and the other evil, those persons or things are better than the one and worse than the other. But if they are in a mean between two good things which do not tend to the same end, they fall short of either of their component elements in the attainment of their ends. Only in the case when the two component elements which do not tend to the same end are evil, both evil, is the participant better than either. Now, if philosophy and political action are both good, but tend to different ends, and they participate in both, and are in a mean between them, then they are talking nonsense, because they are in fact worse than either. Or, if the one be good and the other evil, they are better than the one and worse than the other. Only on the supposition that they are both evil could there be any truth in what they say. I do not think that they will admit that their two pursuits are both either wholly or partly evil, but the truth is that these philosopher-politicians who aim at both fall short of both in the attainment of their respective ends, and they are really third, although they would like to stand first. There is no need, however, to be angry with this ambition of theirs, which may be forgiven, for every man ought to be respected who says and manfully pursues and works out anything which is at all like wisdom. At the same time, we shall do well to see them as they really are. Ah, I've often told you, Socrates, that I'm in constant difficulty about my two sons. What am I to do with them? There's, there's no hurry about the younger one, who's just a child, but the other, uh, Critobulus, is getting on and needs someone who will improve him. I cannot help thinking... Uh, when I hear you talk, that there's a sort of madness in many of our anxieties about our children. In the first place, about marrying a wife from a good family to be the mother of them, and then about heaping up money for them, and yet taking no care about their education. But then again, when I contemplate any of those who pretend to educate others, I'm uh, shocked. Uh, to me... If I am to confess the truth, they all seem to be such outrageous beings, so that I do not know how I can advise the youth to study philosophy. <sighs> ah, Crito, do you not know that in every profession the inferior sort are numerous and good for nothing, and the good are few and beyond all price? Uh, for example... Uh, are not uh, gymnastics and rhetoric and money-making and uh, the art of the military general uh, important noble arts? Ah, certainly they are in my judgment, uh, Socrates. Well, and uh, do you not see that in each of these arts uh, the many are ridiculous performers? Yes, indeed. 
that's very true. And uh, will you, on this account, shun all these pursuits yourself and uh, refuse them to your son? Ah, uh, th that would not be reasonable, Socrates. <laughs> Do you, in that case, be reasonable, Crito? And do not mind whether the teachers of philosophy are good or bad, uh, but think only of philosophy herself. Try and examine her, well and truly, and if she be evil, seek to turn away all men from her, and not only your sons. But if she be what I believe that she is, then follow her, and serve her, uh, you and your house, as the saying goes. And Crito. Be of good cheer. <laughs> that was Euthydemus by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. First come I, my name is Jowett. There's no knowledge, but I know it. I am the master of this college. What I don't know isn't knowledge. <laughs> Performed by Far and Wide. 26th of March, 2019. Ah, I hope you enjoyed that performance, and uh, have a great day.